I'm Nikki Herta, and this is Bright. Stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms, a podcast where we celebrate our state's educators and explore the future of learning. Let's dive in. When Kyron Harvell was a high school student in Flint, Michigan, he breezed through his classes. But when he started college at Michigan State University, things got a lot harder. He struggled during that first semester, and when he ran into a former teacher over winter break and explained this experience, he was told, essentially, that students at his school were expected to go work in a shop or maybe go to community college, but that they'd never been preparing students to go to a Big Ten university like MSU. The experience, he says, made him feel small. It was incredibly disheartening to hear that he'd never been expected to succeed in this way. Today, Kyron is the director of school culture at Lansing Public Schools. His goal? To become a voice for the voiceless. He doesn't want any student in his district to ever feel as underprepared and overlooked as he did that day. Kyron's been in education for 16 years. Before serving as the director of school culture in Lansing, he worked as a principal, an assistant principal, and a guidance counselor. In fact, his master's degree was in counseling, and this was one of his earliest passions. However, due to the many and varied pressures on school counselors, Kyron didn't feel that he was able to have the kind of impact that he'd once dreamed of while in this role. That's when he stepped up to lead. Through the STAR grant that Kyron now manages, he's been able to create real change across Lansing schools that benefit students, families, and teachers alike. Through this grant, he and his staff have launched a wealth of innovative programs focusing on restorative justice, social-emotional learning, culturally responsive practices, and other critical areas of need in his community. When it comes to school culture, Kyron seeks to cultivate a culture of inclusivity, particularly for students who have been marginalized in other aspects of their lives. He wants school to become a place where they can come and know that they are valued, seen, cared for, and that someone is rooting for them. During our conversation, Kyron and I discussed his journey into education, his vision for student learning, and what his hopes are for the future as we continue to grow as an educational community. I'm kind of curious, you said your background originally was a guidance counselor. Yes. And and I'm curious, like, um, you know, just thinking about like back to the time that you were a guidance counselor, like, what did you see going on that made you really want to like, like, what problems did you see students struggling with that made you really want to like step up and make a difference and work on things like this? One of the major problems that I saw during my tenure as a guidance counselor, we know that the Michigan Conference of Guidance Model talks about a certain amount of time being delegated or relegated for instruction, comprehensive services, providing individual group counseling, et cetera. Unfortunately, in the state of Michigan, often guidance counselors get weighed down with just testing and assessment. And my major thing was I want to push the mental health aspect, social learning aspect. My master's degree was in counseling. So I really wanted to focus in on providing that actual counseling because I believe that counseling, dealing with behavior, that's at the foundation of academics. If behaviors are not together, if people aren't, don't have the mental capacity, if they're struggling with regulation, they're not going to perform well academically. So I feel that I need to get into more of administrative roles to have more of that macro level impact to be able to create change at the macro level. So I became a principal. And then 15 years later, I was able to become the director of this grant. But it's been my long-term goal to have a grant such as this. It's totally focused in on equitable access to opportunities, culture and climate, and just culture responsive practices. I want to hear a little bit about um, what it is that drew you to education in the first place. During my high school, I'm originally from Flint, Michigan. And in high school, I did extremely well. 3.5, classes were easy. I probably did my homework in homeroom. Everything was a breeze. And yeah. when I first came to Michigan State, my first year, I was on academic probation because I had not been prepared appropriately for the rigor of the curriculum. And I saw all of my co- classmates from Bloomfield Hills and Sterling Heights, et cetera, and they were just breezing through the class. I'm like, what is going on? How come I'm not grasping this material? And I ran into a teacher over winter break regardless. And they said, you know, hey, how are things going? And I told them, you know, what had happened as far as like probation. And the teacher said, well, Kyron, we weren't preparing you guys to go to a big college like that. We thought you guys would go work in the shop or 
do something, you know, be different and go to community college, et cetera. Nothing wrong community college, but basically said that they weren't preparing us for the rigor of a Big Ten school. And I felt so small and I knew that I never wanted any other kid to experience what I felt, just hearing that the expectation level at the bar wasn't as high for me as it was for others. I can remember guidance counselors encouraging me with 3.5 that I should either rap or play a sport while other kids were being told to go to college and do all these things. And there's nothing wrong with getting into the entertainment industry or playing sports. However, those should be the only avenues that are available for individuals, especially if you are doing well academically. So I think my experience is growing up and then having that happen in college, I recognize I need to change this. I didn't want anyone else to have that kind of experience. And therefore I want to be an agent of change and get into education and try to create opportunities and be a voice for the voiceless. And how would you say that you've seen education change since you started your career in education? Education has changed a lot. Some things are good, some are bad. What's I think the worst thing is that there's so much of emphasis on high stakes testing. I think when I initially got into education, it seemed more, and I could be wrong just in my own opinion, it was more about learning and about trying to ensure that students were well-rounded citizens. We want to pour into the kids, pour into the families. Now everything seems to be about a test and their aptitude and I, somehow we're equating tests with intelligence. And that seems to be the biggest thing. Tests, count day, money, money, money. It seems mm -hmm. like we're missing the core, which to me should be about the kids and the families and pro producing wonderful citizens. So that's been the biggest change. It's almost like school now starting to become a business. Mm -hmm. And I wish that it wasn't that way. When I first got into it, it seemed like it was more about, let's work with the kids, whatever level that they're on, let's get on their level, let's do what we can. But now it seems more that it's a business and that's really unfortunate. Are there any like positive changes that you've seen? I think it's gotten better. The positive change would be that now we're focusing in more on equity. There are grants to talk about, you know, provided for equity, for culturally responsive practices. There are grants to look at recruitment, to look at recruiting more minority candidates. So we look at our country, 90% of the teachers are white females. However, we know 52% of the students in public education are African-American Latino students. So trying to, you know, bridge that gap in terms of ensuring that the staff demographic matches student demographics. So I think we're focusing more on recognizing the importance of minority recruitment. There are grants focused on cultural responsive practices, equity, social justice. So we're starting to see more of the bigger picture and we're starting to see that it's not just about math, English, science, and history. There's a lot more to education and life than just the four subjects. So I think that's one of the positive changes. We're starting to look at the bigger picture of education, not just go to school, get a degree, get a job. But it's a it, we're looking at education as it's life. It's about just learning about life, not just the subjects and I got a four point, but I don't know anything about life. So and I think that's like the positive thing. It's more about life now. We see, we're starting to see the bigger picture now. The STAR grant that Kyron has been referring to is kind of a big deal. STAR is an acronym that stands for School Transformation Acceleration Results. It's a five-year grant from the federal government that has allowed Lansing to target equitable learning opportunities, culturally responsive practices, mental health, and social-emotional learning, among other areas of need. Through this grant, Kyron and his team have been able to build SEL supports, offer individual group and family counseling, and provide a robust array of professional development for school staff in key areas. It's pretty powerful to hear the list of things that Kyron and his team have been able to accomplish and provide to students, families, and teachers through this grant, especially when you consider Kyron's personal history and the experiences that motivate him to lead in this capacity. Can you tell me a little bit like about the students you serve in Lansing School District? Yeah, so Lansing has approximately 10,000 students. Uh, the wow. consist of 39% African-American, 26% white, 19% Lat Latinx, 10% uh, biracial, and about 6% Asian Pacific Islander. So we are grades K through 12. We have 26 schools, three high schools. Our grade configuration consists of pre-K 3, 4, 6, K 8, and our high school is 7, 12. We are about 81% free and reduced lunch. A very high poverty area, unfortunately. But throughout the, through the grant, through the goals of the grant, we're trying to provide services and supports to ensure that we can eliminate some of those barriers for some of our families that are struggling in terms of poverty. So those are one of the key components of the grant. 
you guys are, I'm assuming like doing a lot of different things with that. And you kind of give me the high level, you know, but what are some of like, um, the, like the programs that you've implemented and like how it's a, like, I really like to get at like the heart of the story, you know, like how, how has it affected students and like, what are some things that you're really proud of? Yes. So we've implemented quite a few programs. One of our main programs we've implemented to work on social emotional learning, we purchased this program called Connect with Kids. And this program solely focusing on SEL. There are lessons and videos built into the curriculum. And we've made this a part of our district why asynchronous learning day and it's built to the curriculum on a daily basis so all teachers staff students have their own username and password they can log in it touches on any subject from safety to health to bullying to issues around society social justice being culture responsive and it's grade level specific this has been very popular in the Lansing school district Students love it, staff love it. And again, the program is already built, so teachers don't have to try to find lessons. If there's a sub, et cetera, they can just go right to this program and utilize it. It's very engaging and relevant material. So that's been a really big program for us as we are trying to promote SEL. Yeah. We have a very positive relationship with child and family charities who provide counseling for us. So due to it being virtual, it's been great that we have a contract with them where all I have to do is send them a name and create the referral of families that are struggling they'll provide counseling support for students here in Lansing due to the STAR grant. So we have currently about 54 students that are receiving individual counseling for mental health issues. We have about 50 students that are receiving counseling as related to substance abuse. They provide group counseling. They also provide counseling for families that are in need. There's a family resource coordinator as well that goes out and provides food, assistance with bill payments, clothing, et cetera, for families. So that's been a major initiative. We have two Interventionists, they're called CRPBIS interventionists. That stands for culturally responsive, positive behavior intervention supports. Okay. Collaboratively with the schools to establish CRPBIS teams to ensure that we implement this grant with fidelity. They work on culturally responsive practices. They're working on setting up a behavioral matrix, systems of support, incentives, looking at those kids that have needs that have not been identified and targeted appropriately. They look at the tier one tier two and tier three students work collaboratively with teams to positively enhance culture and climate. Again, with that goal of decreasing referrals, high school suspensions to positively impact attendance and overall social emotional learning of our students as well as their mental health. So they're meeting with teams as we gear up to hopefully come back face to face, but even now in a virtual setting to work with mm -hmm. them to work on CRP best practices. Another major thing that we're doing right now we have an expert series, you call it the Star Expert Series, where each week I bring in a speaker from around the nation and internationally to talk about a variety of different topics from implicit bias to self-care to uh, we have a speaker coming soon during the summer. Dr. Sue is going to talk about issues around Asian Americans and what's been happening as far as Asian hate. Uh, Black Lives Matter, they talk about culture responsive practice, school to prison pipeline. Staff have really benefited from these speakers, cognitive behavioral therapy, mental health, anxiety. They come on a weekly basis. Staff had opportunity to log in via Zoom, which is the benefit of our technology because we can capture a wide audience. And they also present during our district professional development days. We have speakers from MSU, other colleges, colleges around the country that come in, and provide very high level PD. That's been a major thing for our grant. We're currently providing online restorative justice training. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to have all staff train this model. We want to look at things from a restorative mindset. One of my former colleagues stated that suspension is not an intervention. Mm -hmm. We want to look at having a restorative mindset so we can keep the kids in school and maximize instructional time. We currently have 26 staff members that are going through this training. And our goal is to get the entire district trained. We utilize the train the trainer model over the next three years. We provided SBIRT 101 training for now 290 times two years, 500 80 staff, wow. SBIRT stands for School Screening Behavioral Intervention Referral to Treatment. This is for substance abuse screening. So staff are able to recognize different triggers as related to substance abuse and to provide services and supports for our families. PD has been provided for staff through Michigan Virtual, which I believe has been the best PD we've had. Uh, through the grant, we had to purchase a lot of courses. There were also free courses related to SEL, work with individuals mm -hmm. with disabilities, et cetera, and staff were to take part in that PD. And staff were very, very excited because of how qualitative the PD was. Many of the courses, the staff said they were long, but they were engaging. They felt that they learned a lot. There's also free courses and uh, working with strategy work, African American boys, et cetera. So that's been very, very big for our grant as well. We have a program called Trails through the University of Michigan 
where we're facilitators to provide group counseling for students. So we have coaches here in Lansing that are gonna be working with students. They already started at two schools already and we'll have all three schools on board by next week, working in a group counseling capacity with our students providing that training with emphasis on cognitive behavioral therapy and irrationally motivated behavioral therapy. So we have the TROS program. We also have a micro-credential. There are administrators mm -hmm. taking part in a micro-credential through a company called Digimass related to SEL, mental health, equity, and cultural responsive practices. And we plan to continue this program as well to get these micro-credentials going. So those are just few of the programs that we have. We have others, but I don't want to take up all the time talking about no. programs. I talk about it all day, but those are some of the few programs we're really proud of. No, that's really, that's really awesome. To dig deeper into the why behind all of these initiatives, I asked Kyron to tell me more about his vision for student learning and what he hopes for all students in Lansing and beyond. We explored what it might take to actually create these kinds of changes in education, the role technology can play in reducing barriers, and why teacher professional development is such a critical piece in this puzzle. My vision for student learning is just for students to become just well-rounded in all aspects, to learn about different cultures, the importance of diversity, to have empathy. And I always tell everyone empathy is understanding, not acceptance. So just have empathy for all populations, learn about different cultures, learn about different ways, it being exposure, expose them to different opportunities. A powerful experience I had as a principal, I took a group of students to the African American Museum and to Pizza Populous in Detroit, and many of them had never been out of Lansing. And we're on the expressway, going on the expressway. And I say, hey, guys, we're a Lions play. And they said, what Lions? They said, Detroit Lions. Mr. Arthur, are you serious? They had never seen the football stadium. I showed them, not Joe Lewis, now it's called the Lewis Caesar Arena. They couldn't believe the Pistons played there. And just that exposure. And then the kids were like, I really want to go to college now because I want to be able to do things like this more often. So I think just exposing kids to more things, just real world learning opportunities, I think that's just so important. I, I just feel project-based learning, just getting away from the traditional models of learning, culturally responsive teaching practices, bringing in materials that look like and reflect the cultures of our kids, talking about subjects that maybe we may deem touchy, but recognize our kids need to be aware of these things, dealing with issues around social justice. I just feel those things are important. So my vision for learning is that we just open it up the door more and don't just solely focus in on math and science and history, talking about mental health, having conversations, we're starting to see now that students are being diagnosed and having an earlier onset of issues such as schizophrenia and bipolar and ADHD and autism. And before we previously didn't believe that kids could be diagnosed and have early onsets, but now we're starting to see it more. So just not having any taboo topics and just making learning be open to just explore. And there's no question that can't be asked. And just getting away from the whole idea of it has to be about testing and if you received a four point or not, because you may not receive a four point, but what if you got a lot from that class? What if that class is the one that determined what you want to do later? I see learning as not just focusing on college because there are tons of jobs you can get outside of college and also you won't have the large student loan debt that I have. So talk with kids about other things you can do. All of our kids are not gonna to go to college. We have to get past that myth that you have to go to college to be successful. There are plenty of people that do not, that do not go to college and they make a lot more money than I did and they don't have student loans. So talking about what's wrong with being a mechanic, what's wrong if you want to design, you know, put floors in homes, lay carpet, et cetera. So talk with kids about other opportunities and not shaming them if they don't want to necessarily go to college. That's not for everybody. So I see learning just being open, focused on just being culturally responsive, equitable access opportunities, not looking at the haves and have nots. I get tired of hearing about at-risk kids and poverty. What are we doing to address poverty? It seems like we get stuck at poverty, we get stuck at risk. What are we doing to address these things? So just provide the equity access to opportunities. So that's my vision for learning, equity access to opportunities for all key stakeholders and the elimination of barriers. So earlier you were talking about your own personal story, right? And you were saying like that you were upset, understandably, when your, your teachers told you, oh, well, we weren't preparing you for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, you know, you said like, okay, there's some students that might not want to go to college, and that's okay. So how do you design like a school system um, that can accommodate all of that? You know, like, how do you make it individualized? So students, some the students who want to go to college can and be empowered to do that. And the students who want to do something else can do something else. And, you know, how, what do you see as like, what kind of school system can facilitate that? Like, what does school look like in such a way to allow for that branching? When I first began in Lansing, we had vocational programs at the Hill Center. 
and kids could come and learn about auto mechanics, cosmetology, construction, visual imaging, horticulture, culinary arts. I think that we need to bring back vocational programs to all the schools in Michigan. And the way it was set up, the kids would do their academic coursework in the morning, and then the afternoon, they would do, if they wanted to get involved in mechanics, et cetera, they would have the afternoon where they would go to their full program. I think that through bringing these vocational programs back and having that combined experience of the academic and the vocational, that will help the kids to explore all options. Because again, all kids are not going to go to college and all kids are not going to go to vocational programs. So some kids may say, hey, I want to be a doctor. I just have to go to college to do that. Some kids may say, I want to be the person that builds the hospital. Well, mm -hmm. why should you go to college for four years and rack up student debt when you can go to a vocational program, get into a trade school and build the next hospital? So I think the key is to bring back vocational programs and push vocational programs as much as we push academic programs. Because mm -hmm. I think through just solely push academic programs, many students feel marginalized because they because everyone keeps telling them if you don't go to college you're a dummy you have to go to college if you don't go to college you're gonna be broke you're gonna be homeless you can't be anything if you can go to college so if you're the kid that keeps hearing that if you don't want to go to college you go and you waste money and you get a degree and you end up doing something that work in the field that you had no desire to be in but everyone says you go to college so to me we need to bring back vocational programs to all the schools and give kids that opportunity to look at vocational programs and that combination of vocational programs and academics that's the key in my mind what role, if if any, does technology play in your vision for student learning? Technology is playing a very important role, especially as it relates to our grant. There's so much that we can do. Our Lansing uses Google, Google Classroom. There's so much we can do in terms of bringing in presenters, in terms of providing breakout rooms for kids to work in. So for perfect example, tomorrow we have this program called It Figures that's going to work with Pat and Gill Middle School. And what this organization does, they bring in like, these characters, like, like these toys, these action figures. They may bring in an oh, action figure. For yeah. example, they may mm -hmm. bring in Chadwick Boseman as the Black Panther, and they'll have him and they have the kids going to breakout groups. They talk to them about character development, resilience, social emotional learning, confidence, etc. And the kids are able to relate with these characters and relate the characteristics based on the characters that they bring in, and they have dialogue, and then the kids can aspire to be like them. And they wrap it up by bringing all the kids back together and talk about what they learn and they get into breakout groups. It's like the most amazing thing. And they bring in other just figures that the kids can relate to, whether it's entertainers, whether it's someone in movies, whether it's a doctor, et cetera, and talk about the characteristics they have and how they can apply it to their life and what they wanna do later on in their lives in the future. So I think technology opened up a whole nother world for our kids in terms of what we're able to bring to them. Also, it's cost efficient. So if you think about a lot of these programs that we're doing via technology, I pay my presenters a lot less via Zoom than I would if they were coming here face to face. So for example, I brought in speakers that aren't in America. Imagine having to pay out the grant to fly someone here, food, hotel, travel, et cetera. So I think technology has opened up that door as well in terms of cutting down costs, because what I'm able to do is reallocate funding that would have gone to our presenters to provide service supports for students. So I think that's been a very big benefit as well for technology because often, also often, you know, the major goal should be to focus in on what's best for students. I'm assuming your SEL program sounds like it, it probably has some sort of virtual component as well. The entire program is virtual. Mm -hmm. Connect with Kids is an excellent program. I highly recommend any school district take advantage of it. Excellent program. And also what they do, they update the program for me. There's topics that aren't available. Pretty much any topic you can come up with, they have it. And you just click the link and it has videos, cool. built-in lesson plans. It has a parent component where parents work with kids. And it's all, it's all on the computer. Kids can log cool. in whenever. It's great. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of resources that, you know, teachers may have struggled to have time to develop on top of their already, mm -hmm. you know, their existing curriculum that they can access. So that's it. Yeah. Yep. Um, connected to that. I, well, I think it connects to that. You tell me, but uh, <laughs> um, you spoke about a passion for differentiation and learning. Can you talk a little bit about that? And yes, that I'm really like. big on differentiated instruction. I just think that as educators, we need to get past this whole idea of there being tier, quote unquote, tier three kids or kids mm -hmm. we cannot reach. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of we haven't tried all that we can to reach these kids. It's easy to say, well, you know, hey, he's not going to do anything or she's not going to do anything. It's easy to spend time with tier one kids. It's easy to spend all of your time with the kids that don't have behavioral issues and to just dismiss those that do. But we have to work towards meet the needs of all kids. That's what equity is, giving everyone what they need. Not making it fair, not being equal, but providing everyone what they need. That's equity. So I think differentiation is so valuable because we all have different learning styles. 
So we look at the high number of African-American Latino kids that are placed in special ed. And mm -hmm. it's a very large number. Are they truly special ed? Or is it we didn't put the time in necessary to try to meet them where they are? So and it's not to say that there aren't any kids that should not be classified as special ed, I'm not saying that by any means. I do believe that the number is higher than it should be. I do believe that if we spent more time differentiating instruction to try to work with our kids, that we wouldn't keep placing that label on kids because you no, know, there's a stigma that comes with that label. So I'm just really big on differentiating. I think that's the key to ensure that we are providing equity access opportunities for all kids because we're using that special ed and 504 thing a, a little too quickly. We're, we're, it's, it's just happening too much and that's a nationwide issue. But in that, and again, that's not a knock to teachers or saying teachers are doing what all they need to do. I do think we need to spend more time providing training and PD for teachers so they can learn how to differentiate instruction. So we can't make the assumption that teachers know how to differentiate. Many teachers come out of programs and they learn how to teach and anything outside of that, they may not know what to do. So we need to spend more time with training as well. There were a few recurring themes present in Kyron's vision for student learning including equitable access to learning opportunities and culturally responsive practices. In the next part of our discussion, we probe deeper into what problems he's witnessed and what needs to change for us to move forward in these areas. He also shared a powerful story from his time as a principal when he was able to make an impact on the lives of several young women in his school by reminding them that they matter and that they can and will do great things. You mentioned that you're passionate about equitable access to opportunities, social justice, and poverty. Um, can you speak more about what you're seeing and what you think needs to change for us to move forward um, in education in these spaces? So what I'm seeing in terms of equitable access to opportunities, poverty, social justice, schools and school districts that have been labeled as being in low performing or areas where their high rates of poverty are not receiving the same level of service. The curriculum is not as strong. They're not receiving the same supports. And I think that's just totally wrong. So I do feel that's a major issue that needs to be addressed. And I know people can say, well, they pay higher property taxes there. Again, we have to eliminate those barriers and stop looking at money. We're talking about kids. Kids do not have a determination on where they live and how they grew up and what their zip code is, nor is they be penalized for that. So I'm really big on social justice access to opportunities and the whole thing about poverty we have to get past just saying because what happens with poverty is we put a stigma on that well mm -hmm. they're poor now it becomes a crutch poverty doesn't mean the kids can't learn poverty doesn't mean that parents will have desire for their kids to achieve and obtain the same things as those families who may seem to be in the one percent of the upper class ultimately i believe that all parents want the best for their kids that mom that has five kids and working three jobs wants the best for her kids like the mom that's married and has two kids and doesn't have to go to work. That mom that has five kids may not be able to make the parent teacher conference, not because she doesn't care, but because she has to go to work. So I think I want to help to eliminate that stigma around poverty. Let's recognize it exists and recognize it exists. Let's work towards eliminating the barriers around poverty. And that's going to come through social justice and providing equity. So let's say we know they there are some have nots. How do we make them the haves? Rather than just saying they're the have nots, oh well, I'm sorry. You're in a school, there are schools in Detroit where the kids have to go home to get toilet paper or the parents have to bring toilet paper to the school. There's leaky ceilings. But then if you go 15 miles down the road to some other districts, it looks like a palace. How is that equitable? But then the kids are being measured by the same standards when we take the M step. There are kids going through gang areas to get to school and dodging bullets and dodging getting into fights or little girls dodging pedophiles in the community but then they're compared with the same kids who get a ride to school in other more affluent areas. And this is a knock against people that have money, but we have to start working more for those that do not have. So let's look at poverty and look at ways to address it versus just that stigma associated with it. Because the stigma is if you have poverty, if you're in poverty, then you don't have the desire to do more. And you know, oh, well, that's your lot in life. You're never gonna come out of it. You can't change. So those are the things. And I think that's all going to come through providing equity access to opportunities. That's how we eliminate poverty and issues around social justice through equity. Okay, so culturally responsive teaching practices. That's another passion area on your list. What does this mean to you? And why is it so important for teachers to learn this? What this means to me is providing relevant curriculum that reflects the background of our students, reflects the, histo the true historical 
consequences of what has happened to our students and families, which may have led them to be in certain predicaments and for teachers to be culturally competent. This is imperative, especially in the ever-changing world, where, as we said before, 90% of the teachers are white females. That does not reflect the demographic of our students nationwide. So we need to change the curriculum. We need to change discussions. We need to start having talks about what's going on in the world. We start, culture responsive teaching is, talked about uh, the George Floyd murder, what's going on right now with the court, talked about what's happening with uh, racism, with African-American males being shot for no reason, being killed for no reason, talked about what's going on with Asian hate. That's culture responsive teaching. We got to stop trying to shy from those and just focus in on the common core state standards. I said in a presentation a few weeks ago to a district, we need to change CCSS to CRSS, culture responsive state standards. That's what we need to do because the common core is not working. Yep. Why do we have something that's common? It can't be common. We're not, we're, we don't have things in common. How is something common when we have haves and have nots? There is no commonality. So culture responsive state standards. So that's why I see the importance of culture responsive teaching. But again, that comes with teacher training and teachers have to be open and willing to step outside their comfort zone and have those discussions and recognize that even though I may not be able to relate to little James who's five and has to house hop every night and may live with grandma one night and someone else the next night, I can still have empathy for James' situation and try to give James the best seven hours of the day that I can while he's in my presence. I'm wondering if you could give me an example of a time that you saw some of your innovation efforts in Lansing have a real impact on a student. Um, and this could be any of the sort of innovations that you've discussed, you know, so far in our conversation. We had a program called Pretty Brown Girls when I was a principal at Avery Elementary. And it's to focus in on self-esteem, self-awareness, and just having a positive identity. And obviously it's open to all kids. It was just called Pretty Brown Girls, white kids, Latino kids, et cetera. Whoever liked to join the program was welcome to join the program. And the young ladies met for 10 weeks. And then we had the founder of the program. She came on the last day. And we had like a ceremony for the young girls. And I saw the young girls. And I saw how proud they were to be there. And the idea is just something happened, just hit me. I said, I need to do something for these girls beyond this. And I happened to have $1,000 in my pocket. And I stood up and said, how many of you guys are planning to go to college or have ideas about doing, you know, going to work someplace after school? What are your career goals? They started sharing their career goals. And there were 10 young ladies in the program. And I gave each one of them $100 to start a fund. So they could take whatever they want to do with that, whether it's college, whether it's to get ready to have their own business, be entrepreneur, et cetera. And after doing that, that following week, the girls are like, Mr. Arvell, you really believe in us. You really think we could do this. When I tell other people what I want to do, they always say it's not going to happen for me. Nobody in my family has this job. So they said I couldn't do it either. And I just thought just, again, that exposure and someone knowing that someone believes in them was just such a big deal. And I was glad that I could help facilitate that. And I do believe in the kids. It was about me, but it just was on my heart to just to do that for them. Their parents were there. Their parents were crying. People were really grateful. And I just felt like they had a last impact. And that was probably five years ago. And when I see the kids now, I haven't seen them in a while because of COVID, they still bring that up. Their parents still bring that up. It was on Facebook. People were talking about it. And it was about me or for me getting any credit, but it was just saying, we have to invest in our young people. We have to invest in our families. It's hard to be something that you can't see. So we have to keep encouraging them. If there's something you want to do, you can do it. But someone has to believe in you because you're going to have a lot of people there doubting you and telling you, well, no one in your family's done that, so you can't do it either. Why not? So that was something that was really big for me, just having that program. And again, it was for all ethnic backgrounds and just promoting our young ladies. I think often they get lost in the shuffle. We talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline and things for boys and how boys are struggling. But often our young ladies get left out. So it was important to do that. Like always, we closed our conversation by pausing to reflect on the future. I asked Kyron to tell me more about his hopes for the future of education and what advice he has for fellow educators during what has been an incredibly difficult and disruptive year. What are you hopeful for in education? Like, what do you hope to see um, in education? Like, if it were up to you, Kyron, you know, mm -hmm. like the future of education, what would you want to see for every student? What I would like to see for every student is for every student to feel they are in a, that they are valued, they're in an inclusive environment, that people believe in them, that people support them, and that people want the best for them. I want every student to feel that sense of inclusion and to feel that no matter what they bring to the table, there's someone there that cares about them and ultimately wants to see the best for them and their family, just to know, just to build up their level of self-efficacy. That will be my goal for, for vision for the future. I just think that inclusion is so important because we have so many kids that have been marginalized, just don't feel a part of anything. And school is just 
another place to go and be informed that you're nothing. And mm-hmm. I just think that that level of self-efficacy is so important. So for kids to feel that level of inclusion, someone cares for me, people are rooting for me, people are not gonna give up on me. And I think that's how we're going to be successful. And again, that comes to providing equitable access to opportunities for all key stakeholders. Um, do you have any words of advice uh, for fellow educators right now? Right now, hang in there. I, I know right now morale is low. I know people are frustrated. I know the online learning, we're not seeing high levels of student attendance. I know a lot of students are disengaged or are not engaged. I know teachers are tired, they're burnt out, and they're tired, burnt out, but know that we have the most important job in the world. And that is the future of our young people. That's our job. That's more important than the doctors, lawyers, engineers, whoever else we have a supporting job. Hang in there, do what's right, continue to advocate, continue to be a voice for the voiceless. Our kids need us. I know it's frustrating, I know it's tough, but we've got to hang in, we can't give up. Again, continue to be that cheerleader, keep pushing them. They're going to remember it. And you're gonna see them one day later and it's gonna really hit you, you made an impact. After my conversation with Kyron, I was left inspired by his journey into education and how day after day, he continues to fight to create the changes that he knows are desperately needed in our schools. In his role as the Director of School Culture for Lansing Public Schools, Kyron truly embodies his mission of serving as a voice for the voiceless. He's motivated by creating more equitable experiences for the children in his community than the ones that were available to him when he was a student. He wants students in Lansing to see themselves reflected in their curriculum, receive help for any social, emotional, or mental health issues that may be getting in the way of learning, and be prepared for a future in which greatness is expected of them and in which they're supported every step of the way. As we look to the future, we'll continue to celebrate Michigan educators, sharing their hopes, their fears, their dreams, and their beliefs and what's best for our children as we move forward into a new era of post-pandemic learning. Without a doubt, it's hard work to build school cultures from the ground up that are founded in equitable access to learning opportunities, culturally responsive practices, social emotional learning, and restorative justice. But with leaders like Kyron forging our path forward, if there's one thing we're certain of, it's that the future is bright. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms. This podcast is produced by Herbie Gaylord, is hosted by me, Nikki Herta, and is made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Education is changing faster than ever. Discovering new models and resources to move learning forward at your school at michiganvirtual.org.